Okay, here's what I'm going to do. I'm going to talk to you guys today about how I became an author um, and where I came from, like how I started out as a kid. And then if you guys, I'm going to tell you stories about what a writer does. And, um, and then if you guys are listening to my little stories, I'm going to give these away as trivia questions. So those of you guys who are like really listening, we'll leave with a couple of those. Okay, um, the first thing I want to say though is I grew up as a reluctant reader. Do you guys know what a reluctant reader is? It means like you really didn't want to read. Exactly. So it's somebody who doesn't, you just raise your hand and you said you're one? Yeah. I, when I was younger, but now I read like... Oh, you do? Yeah. See, that's cool. See, I'm kind of like you, but you found it before me. Because when I was your age, you guys were in high school, right? Yeah. I still was a reluctant reader. So you, the fact that you found it now... It was a reason like this. Was it really? Yeah. And it was one of my books. That's great to hear. <laughs> wow, that's really a nice message. But, um, no, I'm just kidding. But... When I was your guys' age, I would only read a book if I was going to take a test on it or if I was going to do an essay. That's just the truth. And here's what I always tell people, though. It's not that I didn't like books. It's more that I wasn't exposed to books, and I want to tell you guys why. So I grew up on the border of Mexico and San Diego. Has anybody in here been to California ever? <coughs> what part? Santa Barbara. Ooh, that's a nice place. You were hanging out with fraternities at the college, right? No, no, you were staying. No, you maybe you were. And where have you been? Um, I'm from Tucson, Arizona. So you so. would go with, like vacation there? Yes, in San Diego. Oh, really? What part? Um, we used to stay by Mission Beach. Oh, that's cool. That's a good area. Um, so I grew up in a place called National City. And actually, National City is, is the setting for my second book, which is called Mexican White Boy. Uh, and I'll tell you a little bit more about what that book is about in a sec. But, so I grew up in this really working class neighborhood. Nobody in my family had ever been to college. Um, and here's the, here's the deal. It's not that I didn't like books. It's more that I wasn't exposed to them. Because nobody in my family read. It wasn't what they did. They were hard workers. They all had jobs in construction and stuff. And they never missed days. But school wasn't a big deal. And for my, my parents in particular, my dad, he was 17 when I was born, and my mom was 16. And my dad immediately dropped out of high school. And he had to kind of like provide for the family, right? So his educational goals and ambitions were put on hold. Um, my mom graduated, but the picture of my mom accepting her diploma, I'm with her. Like, I'm the baby of her. So I was there. I graduated twice. <laughs> um, so basically, you know, my family just they, they didn't have education as a, as a high priority, even though they both liked education and they, they said they were pretty good at school. Another thing that really kind of molded who I was when I was young in terms of education is I grew up very poor. And I used to have a big chip on my shoulder for not having money. Like, if anybody came across my path that had money, I would have a huge problem with them. And, but now I'm understanding why I would do that. It's, I wanted to hate them before they hated me. And so that whole poverty thing really shaped who I was when I was young. Um, but I saw a, a movie when I was a little younger than you guys that, that talked about poverty in a new way. And I understood it one way when I was young, and I understand it a different way now. And I'll give you guys the first line to see if you can make sense of this, because I couldn't when I was your age. So to set it up, it's about a Cuban writer um, it's called Before Night Falls. Has anybody, anybody heard of this? If we were in like PBL, we saw part of it. Did you oh, really? Yeah. I'm impressed. Nobody ever knows this movie. It's a very good movie, but... I probably know of it, but probably like cover Just by the cover, maybe you've seen it? Yeah. Well, here's the first line of the movie. Maybe this will jar your memory. So, the camera starts out panning across this desolate Cuban landscape. People are dressed in rags. You know, they're living in shacks. There's just no money, right? And what you realize is that, first of all, there's a baby in a hole dug into the ground, like this deep, this wide, the hole. And the baby's crawling around, and the parents are right next to the hole. Can anybody guess? What do you think this hole is? Why is a baby in a hole? I mean, yeah, what do you think? It's probably like a playpen, maybe. You're exactly right. By the way, nobody gets that, so you should be impressed. Most people say it's a, it's a, uh, a grave, and I'm like, wait, the baby 
moving around. It's still alive. So it's exactly, you're exactly right. It's a playpen. So here's the deal. They couldn't afford to buy a crib or a playpen, so they just made one, right? And so that would kind of like keep the baby contained. That's another thing I, I learned from this movie, by the way, because eventually I'd like to have a family of my own. And I'm not going to buy a crib. I'm just going to dig a little ditch in the backyard. Because <laughs> <laughs> you guys know we're in a recession, right? So you got to save what you can. No, I'm just kidding. Don't do that because you will get arrested in America. <laughs> but anyways, the camera stops on the baby. And here comes the first line from the writer as an adult looking back at himself as a kid. And here's what he says. He says, I grew up in absolute poverty, therefore with absolute freedom. And I'm going to say it one more time. I grew up in absolute poverty, therefore with absolute freedom. When I first heard this, this idea that you're more free if you're poor, I said, you know, whoever wrote this movie doesn't understand it at all. I actually dismissed the entire movie because I thought to myself, if you have money, you're more free because you can go to other countries and experience different cultures. You can go to other restaurants and, and try new foods. And if you don't have money, you can't do those things, right? So I thought, this guy's wrong, what, what he's saying. So I, I dismissed the movie. And I'll get back to, the, to that line in a second. Um, when I was young, I also had something happen to me in the educational system that kind of set me back. So in second grade, um, I struggled to read to the point that the teachers pulled my parents in and said, hey, look, we can't let this kid go to the third grade because he can't read. And you know what that did to me is I thought, well, you know what? I must be kind of a dumb kid. And I think we all do this. Like, if there's anybody in here that's not a good student, I think this is what you do. If you don't experience success in school, then you try to find something else that you're good at. So some people might be good at video games or being popular. For me, I was pretty good at sports. And so I started spending as much time as possible playing sports in particular basketball, and as little time as possible in school because I didn't feel good about myself in that setting. Um, but I remember I would walk into a gym and I'd overhear people saying, oh, here comes that Matt kid, we should get him on our team, he's good. And that made me feel so good about myself, so I, I tried to do that as much as possible. My mom told me, she said, get a 2.9 grade point average and I'll never bother you about school. So what do you guys think I got? I got a 2.9. And if I was ever starting to flirt with a 3.0, I would like miss homework on purpose. I just wanted a 2.9 bare minimum. Not a very smart way to, to approach it, but that's how I, I thought back then. Um, but I think it was my junior high years when I started for the first time hearing about this thing called college. And you know, I didn't know anybody who had gone to college and no family members had. So I had to ask my friend's mother and I said, you know, hey, what's up with this college thing I keep hearing about? And she said, oh, it's this great thing. Uh, by the way, just um, out of curiosity, is there anybody in here who has a parent or doesn't have a parent that went to college? So you, nobody in your family has gone to school? A few of you? Okay, so we're in the same boat. So you guys are, are listening to somebody who's been there before. This is a quick side note. For those of you who might be the first in your family to go to college, I just want to say one thing. First of all, you have like this tremendous opportunity to do something brand new for your family, and that's awesome. But there's one thing that people don't think about. There's also a tremendous burden that's placed on your shoulders, and you're gonna feel guilty for actually doing something new for your family. And I never thought about this when I was young, but when I would go off to college and things would be happening with my family, maybe people are struggling and stuff, and I'm off studying, and then I would come back to the family gatherings and stuff, and I would feel almost like this distance, and I was so scared that they were looking at me like, oh, this guy thinks he's better than us now. So just know that you're gonna have to deal with like, yes, it's a super big positive, but it's also a burden that you're gonna have to like kind of navigate that terrain. But anyways, I asked this woman, I said, so what's, this deal, what's the deal with college? And she said, well, look, first of all, you can take any class you want, like any, you can major in anything you want. And I thought to myself, oh, I would do psychology. I love psychology classes. So, and then she goes, and then you'll have an opportunity to meet all these people from all around the country. And she knew how I was, right? So she said, and you know what, Matt? You'll get to meet all these new girls. And I was like, I'm going to college. 
college. <laughs> I decided I was going to college, right? And then I had to go home and think about how I was going to get to college because that became my goal. And I said, okay, my parents can't afford it. I know that. My grades weren't good enough to get an academic scholarship. And, you know, I didn't even know what community college was back then. I was ignorant to that. You guys probably know that, right? So the two-year yeah. school. I didn't even know about that. So I said, the only way I'm going to get to college is to get a basketball scholarship. So even though I wasn't a good student, I was like really ambitious. I wanted to be somebody. So I played all the time, all day, every day, as much as I could. And you know what? I was fortunate enough to get a basketball scholarship. And it was like this great moment where the newspaper came and they, they filmed me and signing my letter of intent, which says basically, I'm going to play at this school for four years and they're going to pay for the school. And I'll never forget, after I signed the letter of intent, my dad said, hey, Matt, I want to talk to you. And this was a weird moment because I had the kind of dad who never talked. Does anybody have like a silent father? You do? He barely, he barely talks? That's how my dad was? He like no emotion all the time. He what? No emotion? No emotion. God, that's how my dad is. Are we, are we brother and sister? <laughs> <laughs> so I'll give you an example of how my dad was. He would go to work every day. He'd come home, he'd kick his dirty boots up on the, on the living room table. He'd work a toothpick in his teeth. He'd drink a beer, always in Mexican beer because he was really loyal. And he'd watch his favorite show in the world. You guys know that show, Cops? Yeah. yeah. He'd watch that like three in a row and he would laugh every time people got arrested. He thought it was so funny. <laughs> so that's all he would do, right? That's all I knew my dad as. And so when he said, hey, dad, I want to talk to you, I was like, what's this guy going to say? It's going to be all awkward, you know? And he goes, Hey Matt, me and your mom we were talking last night, and honestly, we never thought you were going to go to college. We're like shocked. And I was like, thank you very much. It's nice of you. And then he goes, he goes, but we wanted you to know, we think you're a success. And then he walked away. And I'll never forget, like my dad <coughs> saying I'm a success. And as he walked away, I was watching him, and I thought to myself, why would my dad think I'm a success just for getting into college? I hadn't even taken a class yet. I honestly didn't even know if I was smart enough to graduate college. And I had other friends who were going to go to college, but their parents weren't saying they were a success already. And then honestly, for the first time in my life, I saw that line from the movie equating poverty and freedom. I saw it in a new way. And here's what it is. When you grow up poor, honestly, the, first of all, the bar is set low. So if you do one little thing, just getting into college, your parents think you're a success. And I have a theory that each person in this room wants to impress their parents. If you love your parents, you want to impress them. If you hate your parents, you want to put it in their face, right? That's how I was when I was young. So the fact that I had impressed my parents, you know what it allowed me, it, or it gave me the freedom to, to choose when I got to college, I could study what I wanted to do and not what was going to lead to money and me. 